Hi, everyone. I'm Nancy Lieber, co-director of the National Center for School Mental Health at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to today's webinar, Suicide Prevention, Intervention, and Postvention During COVID-19, What School-Based Staff Need to Know. This webinar is part of our National Quality Initiative for School Health Services series on innovation and emerging best practices. Some technology reminders. This training is being recorded. The recording and slides will be made available to participants by email and will be posted on our websites. Participants will be muted and will not be on video. Please type any questions, comments, or tech issues into the chat box. If you look at the top of the slide, you will see how to access the chat box. Questions from the chat box will be responded to at the end of the presentation and in a subsequent summary resource document. Today's webinar is part of our National Quality Initiative work. The School-Based Health Alliance and the National Center for School Mental Health are charged by our funder, the Health Resources and Services Administration's Maternal and Child Health Bureau to challenge and support comprehensive school-based health centers and school mental health systems to adopt report and improve standardized performance measures. One way in which we help to advance school health services is by addressing emerging behavioral health conditions and issues. Today's webinar is hosted by the National Center for School Mental Health and the School-Based Health Alliance in collaboration with the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, a project of the Education Development Center. I'm hosting today with Katie Stinchfield from the School-Based Health Alliance. Let me tell you more about today's presenters. Dr. Julie goldstein Gremmett is the Director of Health and Behavioral Health Initiatives for the federally funded Suicide Prevention Resource Center and the Director of the Zero Suicide Institute at the Education Development Center. Dr. Barbara Stanley is Professor of Medical Psychology in the Department of Psychiatry at Columbia University's College of Physicians and Surgeons. She's also director of the Suicide Prevention, Training, Implementation, and Evaluation Program, and a research scientist at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. Jennifer Myers is the Training Development Manager for the Violence and Trauma Team at Education Development Center. Ann Douglas has worked with NAMI New Hampshire for the past 14 years in the Connect Suicide Prevention Program, providing suicide prevention, postvention, and mental health trainings to community, military, college, and tribal nation settings. I'm now going to turn things over to Julie, who will be presenting as well as moderating today's webinar. Thank you, Nancy. It's such a pleasure to be here and to be able to participate in sharing this important topic with you. Uh, we'll be talking about suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention during COVID-19. All of the interventions that we're discussing have not been developed for this quarantine. Rather, these are all effective evidence-based suicide prevention practices that our speakers will discuss how to adapt for the circumstances that we're currently in. As Nancy said, I'm with the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, which is funded by the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, and the views, opinions, and content expressed in today's webinar don't necessarily reflect the views and opinions of SAMHSA. Uh, in addition to being the Director of Health and Behavioral Health Initiatives, I'm also the Director of the Zero Suicide Institute at EDC, and I'll talk very briefly about zero suicide in just a moment. So today's presentation is intended to help school communities to think about how to address suicide prevention while we're all quarantined as a result of COVID-19. Our traditional ways of intervening when we weren't in quarantine may not have really been firmly embedded in your school settings or where you work and they may be new to you uh, entirely. And thinking about how to adopt these and use these strategies while in isolation might feel very stressful. Uh, but we know that it's critical and it's needed and it's possible now more than ever. Increased isolation and stress and uncertainty is impacting all of us uh, in ways that also increase students' risk for suicide, but we can prepare and preparedness is key. The three innovative approaches that we're gonna discuss today are necessary and possible and we, we certainly know that they can be effective. 
The learning objectives for today's webinar uh, are to provide the rationale and tools to develop an individual and meaningful safety plan uh, via telehealth. I hope most of you are already very familiar with safety plans, and if not, you will be it after today. Uh, to gain the knowledge to equip teachers or yourselves with the skills to identify and respond to youth who may be at risk and to understand a thoughtful approach to supporting the school and the community should a suicide actually occur. So uh, the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, if you're not familiar with it, we are funded by SAMHSA and we advance the national strategy for suicide prevention. So much like there's a national strategy for uh, youth obesity or for breast cancer, this is the nation's national strategy for suicide prevention. Our job really is to develop the tools, the best practices, and to disseminate those for people on the ground that are leading these efforts or starting their suicide prevention journey. We provide information and tools and resources and consultation to, uh, for systems to be successful. We work across all systems and age bands and settings. So it could be schools or workplace, universities, primary care emergency departments, American Indian Alaska Native, correctional facilities, faith communities, um, many more really across the entire age and setting. We have tailored resources for each of these different communities and different types of stakeholders, particularly high risk populations and a lot of toolkits that support this work. So just to kind of set the stage in case some of this information really is uh, new to you, suicide is the second leading cause of death for youth and young adults, and yet it's preventable, right? So if you think about things that generally youth are dying by, these would be things like illness and accident. And when we think about suicide, that's why you often hear the phrase suicide is preventable. Girls have higher rates of suicidal thoughts and behaviors than boys do, but suicide rates among teen girls have been rising. And in the process, the disparity between male and female suicides has lessened considerably. This is about middle school. The, um, the, the numbers are a little bit lower here, but the trends are fairly similar. So we really like to think about how we approach suicide in any setting uh, is that effective prevention takes all three uh, to be effective. It requires a multifaceted comprehensive approach. No setting can pick one activity or one program and rely solely upon that singular intervention to effectively reduce suicide. So not one training uh, for all your staff is or one screening program is going to really reduce suicide in your settings. So whether it's schools or healthcare systems or communities, strategic planning must take place where the data is assessed both to understand the suicide trends uh, in the community in which you're working and then also to assess how the activities that you're doing are impacting the outcomes and the goals of your program. Everybody in the system needs to be trained. There's a role for everybody and each person needs to know what that role is, what their expectations are, what the policies of the system are, what the practices of the system are. Um, and then these types of training and practices and policies need to be embedded in the fabric of the system in order for it to be sustained. It has to be, uh, the, we need to check the fidelity that we're doing what we say we're doing and we need to ensure that um, this is ongoing. There are multiple important collaborators for an effective suicide prevention program in schools. That could include the school-based health centers and the teachers and the counseling department and parents and students. These are just a few of the resources that the Suicide Prevention Center uh, has available or has created. We have a toolkit for preventing suicide in high schools and incorporates this comprehensive approach that I was just speaking about, um, such as the important role of teachers that Jan will describe today. We have a toolkit for managing what happens when suicide does occur in the school community with step-by-step -step instructions and templates that your community can use and download um, and adapt for local situations. And we'll be talking more about postvention in today's webinar. And then these resource sheets on the right-hand side, we have um, various sort of resource sheets for different stakeholders and settings. All of this is on our website, sprc.org. 
And as I said, comprehensive frameworks for suicide prevention in other settings have also been developed. So I was just talking very briefly about the comprehensive approach in schools, but zero suicide is a framework for suicide prevention in healthcare. There are seven components that comprise this model, one of which is effective safety planning for those identified as at risk, and Barbara will be describing that today. We know that in healthcare, uh, all healthcare settings have to have standardized procedures to identify people at risk and to establish workflows that uh, to ensure that people who need care are getting care and that they come to their appointments and that we track their outcomes. We also have to have fidelity to doing what we think we're doing, uh, fidelity to using these established procedures and policies, and we need to assess that often. We know in systems in which you work, there's a lot going on, people are very busy, and sometimes it's hard to maintain that fidelity, but it's critical if you want your program to be effective. We have an evolving toolkit to assist healthcare settings to conduct zero suicide. It's available at zerosuicide.com. Uh, one more set of tools. I just wanna make sure people are aware that every state has a state suicide prevention coordinator. Uh, these are available on the SPRC pages. If you don't know who your coordinator is, I would encourage you after today to go ahead and look that person up, get in touch with them so that you can sync up what's happening uh, in your state, maybe share resources, and be part of the, um, the collaboration across the state. Again, you don't wanna do this in isolation. The, the best approaches are holistic and really ensure that various stakeholders are at the table. And in addition to some of the resources that SPRC creates, we also uh, warehouse and distribute uh, excellent resources made by many of our partners. The one shown here, uh, Gizmo's Possum Guide to Mental Health. I have to give a shout out to Andrea Duarte, the state coordinator of Connecticut. Uh, this is just a phenomenal toolkit, um, boosts coping skills and help seeking in young children. And the URL is there. Uh, and it's just one example of the many resources on the SPRC website. Uh, finally, because of COVID-19, we did create a section on the SPRC website to uh, where we compiled resources across all different settings um, that are available. We've tried to kind of curate what we see as some of the top uh, tools that we of interest specifically around suicide prevention. And we will be linking to today's webinar from that site as well. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Barbara Stanley to talk about safety planning. And again, thank you for having us. Hi, I'm Barbara Stanley, and I'm gonna be talking with you today about um, screening for suicide risk and doing safety planning for um, those who you identify as at risk for uh, suicidal behavior. So um, we know now that um, COVID-19 um, has re really required of us to make some huge changes in uh, the way we live our lives. That includes social distancing and for many people, isolation. So during this time period, um, telehealth has become an important vehicle for provision of healthcare. Um, this, of course, extends to mental health services and um, to all aspects of teaching at this point. So while telehealth for psychotherapy has expanded in recent years, people who are suicidal are usually excluded from the traditional telehealth services. But given where we are now, Current conditions demand that we find ways to work safely with people who are suicidal using telehealth. And, um, and this really can be done and is, a, is an innovation um, in healthcare. So it's important for us to remember that, you know, under ordinary circumstances, it's very anxiety producing to evaluate and counsel somebody who can be suicidal. Um, and so um, this is true for um, very experienced clinicians, inexperienced uh, clinicians, and, uh, and school personnel generally. Um, it's a normal reaction to, to get anxious when somebody um, who is in front of you um, endorses being suicidal. Using telehealth, not being able to sit with that person, not being able to uh, perhaps see them, um, presents unique challenges if they're suicidal. 
Um, in addition, people who have been suicidal before could have a spike in suicide risk under the current circumstances. They could be really troubled by um, increased interpersonal difficulties due to crowding at home, or it, they could be suffering from not having social support of their peers um, and, um, and therefore have uh, increased suicidality. Um, in addition to being uh, um, more anxious and so uncertain about the future. So the purpose of this presentation is to give you some pragmatic guidance for evaluating and managing suicidal risk via telehealth. So I'm gonna give you some basic guidelines for initiating remote contact with an at-risk individual, how to adapt and do remote screening and risk assessment, um, a little bit of information on clinical management remotely of people who are suicidal, um, a general overview of safety planning, um, and some adaptations that we are using now during this pandemic, um, and then how to use ongoing check-ins and follow-ups in order to help keep people out of the hospital in the, um, the emergency room. And then also a little bit about um, documentation. So it's really important to remember that as you start a session with anybody, um, particularly if you are concerned that the person may be suicidal, you request um, their location right at the start. And, um, and you also request emergency contact information. That is, who is a, the emergency contact um, that you could get in touch with should you lose contact with the person uh, with whom you're talking. So we do both of these things right at the outset because we just want it to be like, okay, this is what we do when we have every interaction. So make it very matter of fact. Um, and then um, develop a contact plan should the video session or the call be interrupted. And so you just talk with them about, okay, so should we get interrupted? This is what we'll do. I'll call you back. We'll have, we'll schedule another time and so forth. But just to know um, and acknowledge in advance that, you know, um, it, you know, the call could get interrupted or the session could get interrupted and you want to be able to have a plan for what you should do uh, if it does. Um, you ask the person to, um, to get in as much of a private location as possible. Sometimes that's not really very possible, um, but you want to, um, to have them be able to feel as comfortable as possible speaking to you um, in a way that, um, is, uh, that encourages as much openness as possible. Um, prior to, um, to the contact, you within your own self should develop a plan for how to stay on the phone with the person while arranging for emergency rescue if needed. This is actually not that easy because if you have one phone, um, it's, uh, it, it's hard to figure out how do, I, um, how do I arrange for emergency contact. So you should be thinking about this and making arrangements in advance. And then for minors, plan in advance um, when and how to bring a parent or guardian into um, the interaction so that you can share with them. In particular, we want to share with them the safety plan and what their role would be. So I'm going to just give you an idea of um, two screening tools that we have used. One is called the CSSRS, the Columbia Suicide Rating Scale. This rating scale just um, gives you a, a way of asking about suicidality. So you'll notice the questions are very direct. Um, have you wished you were dead or wished you uh, could go to sleep and not wake up? Um, and have you actually had any thoughts of killing yourself? These are very direct questions. Sometimes we're not that comfortable asking them. Um, and the experience is that we're less comfortable asking them than the person is on the other side answering them, particularly if they are suicidal. Often people will say, uh, I feel relieved that I was asked about it. Um, so the Columbia is one uh, type of scale. And here's another scale called the ask. Um, so in the past few weeks, have you wished you were dead? In the past few weeks, have you felt that you or your family would be better off without you? And so forth. Um, and so then, and the ask then gives, um, some recommendations about what to do next. But if people um, endorse uh, having thoughts of killing themselves, then you may want to go on and do um, 
a longer version of uh, assessing risk, or you may um, need think, okay, so I, I know enough now that um, I'm concerned about their suicide risk. I want to develop some ways to help keep them safe. And that's where we get into doing safety planning. On the telephone or in a video call, doing this kind of elaborate risk assessment here that, I'm, that I put up, it's probably not that practical and not that necessary, but I just wanted to show it to you for your information. Um, and so um, in addition to standard risk assessment, what we want to do is to assess for the emotional impact of the pandemic on suicide risk. And so um, even though we may not do a full risk assessment, we may want to ask about uh, like suicide, the like COVID suicide specific risk factors. So social isolation, social conflict, um, worrying about health or vulnerability, um, decreased social support, increased anxiety, for those kinds of things, disruption in routines and, and support. Disruptions in routine are very, very important to, um, uh, to talk about and their possible impact on suicidality. People can feel very unmoored from, um, from life if, if they lose their routine. And then you want to also inquire about increased access to lethal means. We all have been, uh, to one degree or another, stockpiling certain things. For some people, they have been stockpiling medications like Tylenol or Advil or, or their pres prescription medications so that they can remain at home as much as possible. So that's good in terms of decreasing the risk of, of uh, contracting the virus. But it's bad if you have somebody in the home who is suicidal and who may take those medications as a way of killing themselves. And so you want to think about how can you keep those stockpiles but remove them uh, from the person who is at risk for uh, suicide. And so there are lots of ways of, of doing that, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and so um, it's really important that given the strain on hospitals and emergency rooms, uh, and the importance of remaining at home for health care, health reasons, we want to identify ways of staying safe short of going to the emergency room. And so this is really important. Also, we, we want to keep people out of the hospital because that is where people who are infected with the virus are going. So we, we want to try to figure out, okay, so how can we um, help the person who is suicidal that we might normally just send them to the emergency room. How can we figure out ways to keep them safe at home? So one easy way of doing that is by increasing contact with them, even brief check-ins until the risk de-escalates. This is actually super powerful way of, um, of helping people. And, um, and this is just simple check-ins. It can be, you know, once a day, it can be, um, you know, every other day. And they're not long, elaborate contacts. They're very quick just to check in about the, the person's risk at that moment. Now, of course, it puts a burden on the, the counselor because they have to make these calls and make these contacts. But this can be actually life-saving for the suicidal person. We want to provide crisis hotline and crisis text line information um, and really encourage them to use it. Um, one thing that, that I will sometimes have people do is um, to do like a practice run with the crisis hotline. Now, we don't want to flood the crisis hotline or the text line, um, but it might make the person um, more comfortable to use these services if they try it once when they're not in an emergency. Um, and, um, and when, uh, on the occasional time when I've had people do this, I make sure they let the, the crisis hotline or the text line know that this was something that their counselor asked them to do just to get them comfortable with it. Um, identify individuals in the, uh, in the current environment who can help monitor the suicidal thoughts and behaviors either in person or remotely. And so this is kind of like a proxy for the counselor 
of people who are around in the natural environment. Um, and by that, I mean either living with them or somebody that they have a lot of communication with remotely um, to be a kind of like a, a helper in, um, in keeping an eye on the suicidality um, of that individual. Now, it has to be somebody that the person is comfortable with and, um, and it might be helpful to, uh, to seek permission uh, and have direct contact with those individuals to kind of help them know what they're looking for. Um, finally, um, we want to develop a safety plan, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, to help people manage their suicide risk on their own. And, um, and then you can also have a, um, a discussion with them about, okay, so we have this safety plan. Can we think of any other ways um, to, um, to help you manage your suicidality so that you don't ask, act on it and we don't have to have you go to the emergency room? And people are really creative with kind of coming up with solutions on their own. And so this is just a discussion that if you could tell the way that I'm talking about it here is kind of better, be, very matter of fact in the way that you have the discussion. And, um, and that's how you approach it with the person. So if the person senses your anxiety about it, they're going to get more anxious about it. However, in the case where you see that the risk is imminent, if the person is telling you, I can't handle it, I can't handle it, I, um, I can't uh, tell you that I won't act on it, you, you do have to get them to the nearest emergency department or call 911. Um, and we try not to do that, especially since um, the police and the emergency departments are, um, are really overstressed. But, um, but if you need to, of course, you use that. And so then if risk is imminent, you try to stay on the phone with them if possible until they are in the care of a professional or a supportive person, an adult in their environment who will accompany them to the hospital. So, um, so one of the things that's really important here is, I call this a suicide risk curve. And it's really important to know that um, this, the time that somebody has the urge to act on suicidal feelings is really very, very brief. Um, and so uh, when we talk about getting them through a suicidal crisis, you can be talking about simply just getting them through a period of a matter of minutes. Sometimes it's a few hours. And so, uh, and then the crisis goes down. So if, if we have sent them to the emergency room, one of the things that often happens is the person gets to the emergency room and the, the suicidal urges have dissipated by then, but yet they're in the emergency room and then they become part of the system. So we try really hard to, um, to manage them uh, without doing that, especially during this, this time period. And so this is where uh, brief crisis interventions come into play. And this is actually why the crisis hotline and the crisis text line are so helpful for people. Um, so um, in addition to calling the hotline or, the or contacting the text line, we have people develop a safety plan. And this is an intervention that I developed with my colleague, Greg Brown. And um, this is widely used. And it is a plan that we developed. We develop one-on-one -on -one with a um, person who is suicidal. Often it's people who have already made a suicide attempt or who have a clearly identified suicidal crisis where they ended up going to the emergency room or um, they got dangerously close to acting on their um, suicidal feelings. Um, and so um, we have a series of six steps that we go through with them uh, that starts out with identifying their warning signs. Um, in other words, what are the signs for them that they are either entering a crisis or are in a crisis? Um, and, um, and then, and the reason that we identify those warning signs is because we want them to know when those warning signs are present, hey, it's time to grab that safety plan and put it into action. And so the idea behind the safety plan is kind of um, taking them and diverting their attention off their suicidal feelings just for a period of time so that um, time passes 
and also by doing some of the things on the safety plan can help them re-regulate their emotional state and, um, and help the suicidal crisis to pass. Um, and so we have them do things first by themselves, that's called internal coping strategies, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about them in a minute. We have them use social supports for distraction and social supports for help in a crisis. So these are two different ways of using people in their environment. The first, you're not telling people um, about feeling suicidal. This is simply kind of to get your mind off the suicidality. Who can you turn to? Where can you turn? Your social supports. We're just engaging in social interaction. Uh, the next is um, using social supports for help. Who in your environment can you turn to and say, hey, I'm in trouble, feeling suicidal, whatever kind of words the individual is comfortable with. Can you help me? Can I talk this through with you? Um, and then going up to seeking professional help, if they have a professional in their life that they can turn to or um, having the, um, the emergency room, what, what is the hospital that they would go to? And, um, and then of course we have the crisis hotline and text line here. And then finally we talk about um, means reduction, which is simply what are the ways that people would think of hurting themselves, killing themselves, that they've used in the past, and how can we reduce their access to that during this period of time when they're feeling suicidal. Um, so usually we do this in person. We can't do that right now, but doing it remotely is actually quite similar to conducting it in person. Let them know what it is that you want to do, that you want to do a safety plan with them so that um, should they get suicidal again, they have a, a plan of action that they can rely upon um, so that they don't hurt themselves um, and let them know about how long um, it will take to do it. Um, emphasize that having a safety plan is really important right now because we want to help them stay safe without going to the emergency room. Um, Okay, and so if you think about when you get onto a plane, every single time we get on a plane, we go through the safety procedures. What's the emergency procedures that we use, um, that, would, uh, that we would have to use should there be a dangerous situation on the plane? So the, the, the one that is most common is um, cabin pressure dropping. And so each and every time we get on a plane, there is a video or the flight attendant tells us that um, should the pre cabin pressure drop, we put the uh, oxygen mask on ourselves first and then we put it on the child uh, if we're traveling with the child. Everybody knows this. And so um, why do we do this? We don't want to have to have people thinking about what's the best solution? How do I do this? When they are in a heightened emotional situation. And so we just want something automatic to kick in. Um, and so that's what, the, that's what a safety plan is about. Similarly, um, in um, every October in New Jersey, and maybe this happens across the country, we have fire safety week. And, um, and so somebody from the fire department usually comes to the schools and talks to the kids about a number of things having to do with fire safety, including what to do if you should catch on fire. And so you stop, drop, and roll. Everybody knows this. And so the idea is that just like with uh, on getting on a plane and what you do when the cabin pressure drops, you don't want to have to think about, oh gosh, I'm on fire, what do I do? I stop, drop, and roll. And so, uh, so that is the idea behind a safety plan. We are in a heightened emotional state equivalent to being on emotional fire um, when we are in a suicidal crisis. And so we don't want to have to um, ask our suicidal um, clients or students to think about what do I do now? Um, and so, um, and, and so we want them to just have a plan in place that they can, they can use and get them through the emergency. Um, so because we're doing this remotely, uh, we have to arrange for them 
um, to get the safety plan? How do we get a copy with them? So you need to talk with them about um, how to do this. For some people, we have them write, just write it down. If we're super low tech, we have them write, to get out a piece of paper and a pencil and write it down. Um, a better way of doing this is for the counselor to write down the responses, either to take a picture or scan it or and email it or text the plan um, to the individual. If I'm having somebody write down the responses, I want to make sure that they're actually writing them down. And so what I say to them is, I'm going to ask you to write these down. I'll write them down too. At the end, I'm going to have you read it back to me so that they know that they are responsible. They can't just like be pretending to write them down. We know that they're actually writing them down because we're going to ask them to read them back. Um, and so uh, one way that we can help people identify warning signs, and this works really well with, um, with youth, is to, um, to have them think about an emotional thermometer. And um, you know, think about a scale from one to ten, with one being in the best uh, possible emotional place, and ten being totally out of control with your emotions. And um, and so we have we can have them think about um, okay. So when you are to the point of like a six on the, this emotional thermometer, where things are really heating up, what is it that you're feeling? What is it that um, uh, that is going on in your body? And so for some people, it might be I'm feeling super angry or I'm feeling so depressed. Um, I'm, um, I'm feeling so frustrated, feeling like I just have to get out of here. Um, and so um, so we have them identify that and we those are likely to be warning signs for them. Uh, and you let them know that, it, you know, when you get to that place, and for, pe for different people, it's different places. So for some, per some people, they can get to an eight out of 10 and still pedal back and get in control. For some people, once they are a five, it's like the point of no return for them. And so you wanna have a little discussion about them, like where is it that it is really the danger zone that if you get to this place, you're gonna be in danger of acting on um, your feelings and for you, we already know that you have gotten suicidal. We want to make sure that you don't get to that 10 where you actually engage in suicidal behavior. Um, and so when you get to the point of um, where things are getting out of control for you, and we notice some of the warning signs, um, it's time to pull out the safety plan and start using it. So what we want to do um, with people who we are suicidal is we want to help them identify super simple activities that they can do by themselves. Um, and we want to try to make those activities like as fully engaging as possible. In other words, we want them to think of things that they can do that will, um, that they won't even notice the passage of time when they are engrossed in that activity. Um, and so, um, uh, it, it's, this is not rocket science, uh, but this actually really is very, very helpful. Um, and so we want to identify things that can distract from suicidal thoughts and de-escalate the crises while time is, is passing. And so uh, some simple things are, would be, so for example, if they are in a supercharged emotional situation where there's a lot of conflict, simply removing themselves. However, um, uh, more active kind of strategies are things like using a mindfulness app, deep breathing. So we have to think about things that people can do now while they are pretty much staying at home. What are the kinds of distracting activities that people can do? Um, knitting, video games, watching, um, television, we have to identify if they are going to be watching television, what are the kinds of programs that they watch that will de-escalate their suicidality. Um, doing self-soothing activities, do something nice for yourself. Um, and then um, um, how, for some people, they've really gotten into contributing virtually, uh, doing a little fundraiser, 
um, sending out nice messages, you know, pleasant messages. And for some people, not only is that distracting, but it also contributes to their sense of, um, of self-esteem. So, okay, so we identify two or three things that people can do that they can do just by themselves in the environment that they're in. If that works, great, put the safety plan away and go about their, their normal activities. If that doesn't work, then you want to say, okay, it's time to go on to the next step on the safety plan and think about um, uh, what are the kinds of ways that you can engage people in your environment, and that by environment I mean either in person or remotely, um, that can take your mind off your problems in the same way that activities do. And, um, and so, um, so you can focus on virtual activities like you know going to uh, a museum or a zoo you, you need to get the person who you're doing this plan with who's going to use the plan to identify what kind of virtual activity speaks to them you don't want to tell you know a 13 year old kid to uh, watch a theater performance who had any and he, and, he has no interest in the theater. And so you want to identify what are the kinds of virtual things that they can do online that are kind of social, um, but, um, uh, and that can take their mind off their problems. Identify virtual meetup groups um, that, uh, that they can um, go to online. You want to make sure that these are healthy groups, that they're not going to make them more suicidal. Virtual hangouts with friends, same thing where they can um, engage in activities together, like watching a movie or playing board games. And this is actually um, a, a kind of easier and maybe better for um, adolescents to do as opposed to having social conversations where it can be very, um, can end up getting upsetting. Watching a movie together um, or playing a board game together um, has a lot less potential for making the person more upset. Um, and, and we have interactive online games, um, and then focus on the, the social environment in which the person um, um, is living. And so who in this environment can they talk to that is like a good person to talk to, not about their problems, but just actually often it's the person who likes to talk the most in the environment who can just like be, you can have the person just be in an interaction with them and, um, and not tell them about their problems at this point. And then you want to brainstorm with the person. What are the, what are kind of like spaces for them to go to virtual meeting spaces? Um, it could be, um, uh, uh, house of worship kind of not necessarily services but there are groups supportive chat groups and then you also want to identify where can they go that um, that when they're out among people but they're still socially distanced and so that, that would typically be like a park or a hiking trail um, so if that works great then they go back to their normal activities if that doesn't work then you want them to identify who can they turn to that will help them. Um, who can they say, hey, I'm in crisis. Um, and when you're working with um, a uh, youth, you let the youth know that you are going to share this plan with a trusted adult in their environment. And it would be great if that trusted adult was on the on the plan, but you want to let the youth know before you start developing this plan that this plan is going to be shared. Um, and so um, you, as the person counselor developing this plan, want to be able to contact those people on the plan who are only in this particular role. They are the supportive people who the suicidal person is going to turn to. Um, and um, and so um, you then will share the plan with that person and and go through it with them and and let the person know oh, the same thing that I just talked about about the suicide risk curve that it only lasts a short period of time and we have strategies that can help um, your suicidal child get through that time without having to go to the hospital. Um, 
Okay, and so you want to have a, a, a discussion with the youth about what you are doing, about sharing it with an adult and why you are doing it. And then, of course, you, would, I, you want to identify the emergency contacts. We don't leave anything to chance here. We just say, okay, this is the emergency room that you would go to. These are, these are your healthcare professionals. You have everything there on the list. Um, okay, and then we want to make sure that the contact information um, is, uh, is virtual rather than in person, unless they're living with the person. And so it can be any kind of contact information. It can be uh, uh, telephone numbers, video chat, social media, game consoles, like how they get together normally. Um, and we just want to let them know that um, this can feel a little different than uh, it would be for in-person contact, uh, and it may mean different um, things to them. Now, for youth and younger people in general, uh, virtual contact is probably more comfortable than in-person contact and more routine. And so this is not that much of an issue um, for, um, for younger people. So finally, I just want to talk a little bit about reducing access to, uh, to means. As I said, people are storing up um, uh, medications. Um, and in fact, um, in some places, uh, gun stores have had a run on uh, people purchasing firearms. And so, um, so people are doing a lot of things to what they consider to make their environment safer. And yet, if you're living with somebody who is suicidal, it makes the environment more dangerous. And so you have to have a discussion, both with the youth and the parent about how to make the environment safer for this suicidal person. Um, and so there are lots of ways of doing this. I won't go into all of them here, but you, know, you can take pills, lock them away uh, in a little, um, you know, in a, in a safe or a, a a lockbox, uh, or if that's not possible, you, you know you don't have one. You know most bedrooms, or you know have do have a lock. You can keep one bedroom locked. Um, you have to be creative about this, um, and think about uh, how are how can you keep the environment safer for the suicidal person. And then we always ask about firearms to make sure they are safely stored or removed because they are, we know, extremely lethal. More than 90% of the people who try to kill themselves with a firearm um, or die. They, there is no second chance for them. Um, so then um, one other thing that we can do is if you have additional time, one of the things that we should think about is during this time, okay, so we get the person through the suicidal crisis, how do we help them build a little bit of reserve? Uh, in their lives. And so um, you want to try to, um, uh, to encourage them to develop a plan to keep them stable um, and to maintain their mental reserves. And so it's like you kind of think about this as like, you know, building up for to run a marathon. And so you, um, you, you just don't go out and run a marathon. You have, you have reserves that can get you through it. And so for the suicidal person, the emotional reserves um, have to do with uh, just having a number of things in their life that help build reserve. And that they're really simple, but um, during COVID, a lot of people have lost their way with this. So you want them to develop a daily plan and follow it. You want them to have a regular schedule. And so daily plan is different than a regular schedule. Daily plan is I'm doing this, 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 this on Monday, this, this, this on Tuesday. A regular schedule is the overall kind of um, way that you're living your life, which is you want to ha have good sleeping habits, you want to eat regularly, and you want to try to build in as much exercise as possible. Um, this may sound simple, but trying to get people out into the world um, like go outdoors at least once daily um, in a safe manner is really important. You find with adolescents spending a lot of time alone in their room kind of get, can get them to go deeper and deeper and deeper into um, feeling bad. And so as much as possible to help pull them out of that. 
you want to encourage them to acknowledge and accept the range of feelings. People are going to be anxious or frightened. That is, that makes sense. And we want to just say it, it makes sense um, that you are frightened. Uh, it makes sense that you're anxious because of uncertainty. And so we really want to help them work on acceptance, like you're not a freak for feeling so scared. Um, and then finally, to build mastery, like have them learn, you know, have them think about something that they would have liked to learn that they can do safely at home um, and um, do a new thing uh, and encourage pleasurable activities. Okay, then I just want to end by talking about ongoing contact. Um, so as I said earlier, we can help people stay out of the hospital, stay out of going to the emergency room by, uh, by simply having very brief contacts. And so the contact should be sh short, you know, max 10 minutes. Um, and so you want to conduct a suicide screen at, uh, at each of those contacts. So you just want to check in about their suicidality. You don't want to say, okay, now I'm getting out my CSSRS and asking it. You do it in a conversational manner. Um, you review any changes in risk or protective factors. What has happened? Has somebody in their environment gotten COVID? Has somebody died? I mean, this is happening um, all the time now. Are there new access to lethal means? What's going on that might increase their suicide risk? And then try to, um, to help them figure out ways, very simply, of mitigating those risks. And then ask them if they have used the safety plan, um, and if they have, did it work? What didn't work? Um, and, um, and to revise it if you need to, and then figure out again how they're getting it. Um, and then plan for the next contact, which should be based on the risk that you are identifying. And then finally, just check in with their daily plan to see if they are able to execute it. And, and if not, why not? And to see if you can kind of support them through it. Um, it's important, as you probably know, to document all your interactions um, and what your thinking is and to consult with your supervisor and peers on any kind of challenging decisions. I work in a group where uh, we've seen, all of us have seen hundreds of suicidal uh, individuals, but we still consult with each other all the time. Uh, it's one of the best ways of, um, of figuring out if you are doing the best that you can for the suicidal person. Um, and then you also want to think about your own mental health and your own sense of isolation. Um, and uh, we know that it creates an additional burden if you are working with somebody who is suicidal. And so you want to take care of yourself and then also arrange periods of coverage for yourself so you can have time off and you let the person who you've been doing contacts with, follow-up contacts with, to say that you are taking some time away when that time away is and to make a plan with them for what they should do during your time off. So I'll just end here and these are um, some of the resources available to you. There's, um, there's an app uh, that we've developed called Safety Net. It's both on iOS and Android. There's another app called My3 um, that's also available that does safety planning. And then I just present to you um, some of the articles that, um, uh, that we've written. And now I will turn it back over to Julie. Thank you so much. Uh, so much really important information. We know safety planning is such an evidence behind it and it's really one of the critical pieces of care. Uh, and caring for people at risk for suicide. A couple questions that came in were about uh, people noticing the copyright on the bottom and wondering if they are able to utilize the template that you showed. Yeah, so the thing that we, um, we asked people to do is, this is freely available, the only thing we asked them to do is to just register on our web website, which is suicidesafetyplan.com, so that we can just keep track of who is using it. But People are free to use it. It's been incorporated in, uh, in, in electronic medical records um, uh, and so on. And another one other question, I think, before we turn it to Jen, uh, because I imagine this happens elsewhere. 
I've, somebody mentioned that schools don't want to use safety plans because it cites increased uh, potential for liability in case somebody does die by suicide and the, and then the people, the families say, well, a safety plan implied safety, or does it put the school at risk in any way for using a safety plan? What would you recommend around liability safety plans and the, and their use in schools? So number one, I would say, um, I wouldn't ever do a safety plan with an adolescent without having a parent or guardian know that the safety plan is being developed and to be a part of it and to review the safety plan with the parent. And if the parent says, no, we don't want it, um, okay, then they don't want it. But um, I think the other thing is, what is, what is the alternative to know that, um, that you have, um, that the, the, the adolescent or child is suicidal and you do an evaluation and then what? Um, and so, um, you know, uh, I, I think that if you are doing something that is um, best practice, which this is, um, and you, ex you know, you document your rationale for it, I can't imagine, I mean, if anybody can sue for anything, but a safety plan doesn't mean that, um, that the person who is, has the safety plan is 100% safe. I mean, maybe we should be, call, be calling it a, a safer plan, safer plan, it's, as opposed to safety. I mean, it, it's better than not having a safety plan. Yeah, thank you, Barbara. And that's what I was going to say, is I think you, should a student die by suicide and the school or the school counselor have to defend themselves, uh, in the absence of a safety plan or absence of documented interventions that have an evidence base, I, I think you're at higher risk. Um, the evidence is clear that safety plans work and they're an important piece of a comprehensive and dedicated approach. And, uh, and so I think what we've heard from all the lawyers is a lot of it is working through with the student, their family, uh, to really ensure its necessity, but also absent, you're at greater risk for not using the interventions that we know actually work. Right, so one, one person just um, mentioned something about um, safety contracts. And just so that you know, we don't have time to get into it, but a no suicide contract or a safety contract is very different than a safety plan. They're two different beasts. Um, and so that, that's really important to, um, to know. Right, Con people, don't, we, people don't use contracts, I think is the short answer. They are not, uh, they're not a document. They do nothing to help the youth. Uh, they help the, they may make the professional feel more confident, but there's really no, there's no evidence that a contract does anything. And again, I just want to apologize for all of the trouble at the beginning with all of the pop-ups and the not uh, forwarding. So I'm sorry that that happened, folks. Nope, thank you, Barbara. I'm going to Really appreciate your time and expertise, and I am going to turn it over to Jen Myers now. So thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I want to say good afternoon or good morning to everyone. Um, we're going to get into some of these identifying youth and ongoing social emotional learning and mental health supports. I just want to mention that here on the violence and trauma team at the Education Development Center, we're training teachers all over the world in resiliency, trauma-informed schools and services, and really best practices for leveraging all resources across the entire school and community. So you've heard a lot of great information from Barbara, and what I'll be focusing more on is how we can um, engage everyone, basically, in this work. Let me remind you first that the stressors our students and families are experiencing are also things that we as teachers, school professionals, administrators are experiencing also. And in order for us to really truly help and build a good safety network, we need to make sure that we are okay too. Uh, we are trying to meet the needs of students, families, communities, and manage our own um, houses and kids and parents and other things too. So I encourage you to put your mask on 
first, like you would do in an airplane, even if we're not traveling right now. So I wanted to comment here that while we're talking about challenges and specifically suicidal crises and how to address them, I just wanted to remind people that while we might focus on trauma or historical trauma, there's also historical resilience and that communities for hundreds of years have shown remarkable resilience. And this is our role as school systems and as individuals in our work is to make sure that we're tapping into this resilient nature and really looking for those that need that additional support so that they can have fun around the table doing their schoolwork like these young people are. I'm going to get into what do we look for as a school in identifying how do we know which students are struggling. And when we think about suicide risk, we need to think about what life circumstances might contribute to an increased risk. So we need to look for those students who might be being picked on or bullied, especially in a cyber space, and encourage uh, students, staff, uh, anyone in any support role to help identify them. We need to think about those students who might be additionally isolated right now, maybe without the internet or unable to access certain social connections like Barbara mentioned that people might be doing to connect right now. We look for those who might have a relationship breakup and remember that a number of suicidal crises actually emerge in youth because of a relationship breakup and we need to make sure that we are very aware of these things that as helpers we may not see as a full crisis at that time. We need to think about those who experience some illness or chronic illness or even the athlete who isn't able to finish their career right now but also had maybe an injury their last game or so and think about the life circumstances that might play a role there. We also need to look for students who might have complex or challenging home lives. So there, there might be community risk. We know that some students really find school to be a safer space. And without that physical environment, there could be some additional risks right now. So we need to look for the increased rates of violence or substance misuse that might be available in someone's home or communities. And we also need to pay attention to adverse childhood experiences. Most of us know that. Uh, see the ACEs on the screen here. Research shows that kids who score uh, higher than a four have a 1,200% increased risk of suicide. An A score higher than seven is a 3,100% uh, compared to those who did not. And that's kind of across someone's lifetime, but we're talking about suicide prevention, not just in the now, but also how do we prevent these crises in the future. Looking for physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, they're also signs of higher risk for suicidal ideation. And I know it's been hard for some people to think about screening for abuse in the home right now. You might think about a code word or even a code signal, especially for those that you are concerned about right now. We know that those who have um, experienced a suicidal crisis before likely will not go on to die by suicide. Yet, it is a significant indicator of higher risk. And so we need to look for past suicidal behavior, past suicidal thinking, and really add extra supports for those students. We've also seen an increase in firearms in the home uh, right now in this pandemic time. And we can provide information to families about how to store firearms and medications to have suicide safer homes. And there are many resources at the Suicide Prevention Resource Center to do so, as Julie mentioned earlier. You heard Barbara mention looking for warning signs. We need to think about how we might see these warning signs right now. So we might pay attention to when you hear a comment of having no reason to live or being a burden or even looking for ways to kill oneself to make sure that we're not thinking, oh, it's just a rough time, but that we honestly as a whole system take that seriously. We need to look for the additional warning signs of suicide risk and uh, we need to think about statements that might be happening right now, things like, is this ever going to end? Will this get better? Nothing will be the same. 
We might even as adults feel that way and be saying these things. We might hear them from students and say, yeah, I know, I've never experienced anything like this before. Instead of pausing, backing up and saying, what did you mean when you said this is never going to end? What did you mean here? When you say nothing will be the same, tell me more about what that means to you and draw out these signs to see who's feeling like things have changed a lot and it's different and who might be feeling hopeless or feeling trapped. We know that students and families have changed their access to certain coping strategies like the arts and after school clubs and events and spiritual activities and sports. And so we know that there may be some increased substance use. Students might be feeling more anxious or agitated. Think about the students who were feeling that way before, if they're sleeping too little or too much, and paying attention to mood swings that are outside of developmental mood changes and compared to pre-pandemic baseline. You know your students in your school and you know what might be different for someone now we know that if there's an existing relationship, those connectors are key, and yet we know we might need to support them too. When you think about this uh, social, emotional learning and mental health, most of you know this tier uh, analogy or tier one, tier two, and tier three. Typically, you might have about 15% of the student population getting tier two, about 5% maybe getting tier three, somewhere in a range. That might be a little broader right now given the additional stressors for students, and we need to revisit our strategies and expand our network for social emotional learning and plan accordingly. So what do we do? We need a plan to support all students. We need to make sure that we're applying trauma-informed principles, that we're asking for empowerment and voice and choice, even with younger people, just like you're hearing with safety planning, who should be on that safety plan? You can still involve parents and guardians and expand the safety net for those who might want certain people to be on there with them. We can teach flexible uh, thinking skills. We know that rigid thinking, black and white thinking can contribute to increased mental health challenges. So we can teach people to be more flexible in their thinking. Um, and we can teach problem solving and coping skills if you think about suicide risk, protective factors against suicide, problem solving skills, coping skills, connectedness, access to adult supports and mental health supports are important. We can do this with everyone. Make sure that we're helping students identify and label emotions. One thing you can ask when you log, when you have a virtual class or you check in even with families, how did you sleep last night? How have you been feeling right now? How are you managing some stress? Is there any stress in your home? Do it universally with all students so you can hear where people are at and identify those who might be, need those additional tier two or tier three supports. We need to review those who are on our tier two and tier three supports before, especially for suicide risk. And we need to think of a comprehensive plan to really meet their needs. Who do we need involved? How do we visit that safety plan? And how do we create not just the put the fire out plan, but the fire prevention plan? Um, that's also a part of this work with tier two and tier three. Look for those, as I've said before, past trauma, previous suicidal behaviors, adverse childhood experiences, and those who might be in a higher risk group that we know about. Native American, LGBTQ, so lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, gender nonconforming, or what really is truly gender diverse individuals, really looking for them. And then teaching our whole support network, not just the mental health professionals, and I am one, I'm a therapist, but I wanna expand it to everyone. How can we use mindfulness, distress tolerance skills that we teach in DBT, and other cognitive behavioral skills to prevent what might become a suicidal crisis so students aren't thinking, my life is over, but they're able to calm and distress, put the fire out, and then uh, use those flexible thinking skills to identify additional supports. So expand your safety net. Don't put this on 
only the mental health professionals and things like that. Talk to families about how to talk about the pandemic in an appropriate way. Encourage students to reach out to other students. Think about isolated and disconnected students. How do we reach out to them? So ask your other students. You don't put pressure on them. You just say, hey, I'm wondering, you used to say hi to the so-and-so in the hallway. Since you aren't seeing them in the hallway, have you reached out to them at all? I wonder if everyone can reach out to just one person outside their typical network and see if we can engage that some more. Think about what you teach to expand the safety net. So what to look for. You might provide it in a, a, an email blast out to everyone in your school system. Here are the warning signs of suicide risk. Here's how to ask about suicide and include things like the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale or the Ask Q, both free resources, both available. What you see on the screen here is actually a community card that says ask your kids, care for your kids, embrace your kids. And then the questions for this are on the other side. Um, what to do if they're concerned. The policies and procedures have probably changed. Make sure all your school staff, administrators, and families know what to do, who to go to, how do I reach someone if I'm concerned about someone, especially as it relates to school. And then how to play a, a role in a safety plan. As a high school athlete, trust me, my coaches played big roles in my life, and they need to make sure that they are a part of a safety plan and know what to do. You can teach people to do caring contacts. A random, actually it's been repeated many times, I shouldn't say just one, but randomized control trials, mostly with adults, have shown for those who attempted suicide, they didn't actually get other treatment, they refused treatment, what did they get? A postcard. And over years, it found that those who got a postcard, not telling them to do anything at all, just that someone cared about them and thought about them, those who got the postcard were more likely to live. We can send these caring contacts. Let students and families know we're right here, but also just, hey, we care about you. Each day will be a little bit better. We're sending caring thoughts, not asking for anything else. And this can help us, one, for students to feel more comfortable to reach out when they need it. And two, for those who made me need it, they're reminded that person's right there and they got my back. I heard some people say safety planning apps. The slides will be sent out. You'll get a chance to access these more. I'm also a big fan of the virtual hope box. It's a cognitive behavioral therapy strategy for suicidal thinking. And then um, there's some general mental health apps for students too that might be helpful to expand those distress tolerance skills, expand what you put in that second part of the safety plan. And we can all use these types of things um, to be able to ground and center and move forward, uh, hopefully through suicidal crises without suicidal behavior. So that said, I'm gonna hand over uh, to Julie now. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. That was so helpful. Uh, I mean, I, we're really trying to give a lot of resources about very exact tools that you can start using tomorrow. So uh, thanks, Jen. And as I'm seeing in the chat, all of these resources will be available in the next couple of days with uh, links to the many apps and resources we were talking about. Uh, next up is Anne, and Anne is going to talk about postvention in schools. So Anne, take it away. Thank you very much. Oops, hold on, I just need to. Okay, here we go. All right. So thank you very much um, for including the National Alliance on Mental Illness, uh, New Hampshire in today's panel. And thank you to the, uh, the collaborative uh, sponsoring organizations. I'm, um, although I'm playing um, cleanup hitter here, it's a tougher topic. And I just wanna, make us aware of that because unlike what Jen and Barbara um, covered in terms of being um, an effective response to keep the person still alive from their suicide risk, I will be talking about postvention. And postvention is about an effective response after a person has been lost to suicide. So postvention response is very imperative and critical for mental health 
and especially for school and campus organizations to know and to plan for in advance. And we do it to prevent future suicide incidents from happening. This is our self-care slide, and I think it's really critical um, anytime we're talking about uh, suicide risk, uh, but especially when we're talking about suicide loss, because we're talking about death and dying. And so the Connect program here, uh, .org, is a, a, a good resource, but by no means the only resource uh, where anybody who has lost somebody close to them, whether personally or professionally, uh, can know that they're not alone moving forward. Um, so I just want to uh, put a plug into practicing good self-care for yourselves and seek any kinds of support that would be helpful for you after today's uh, panel presentation. Suicide mental health and stigma. It's very interesting. If you look down below, we have secrecy, we have isolation and guilt and shame and blame and lack of support and rumors. And unfortunately, these negative connotations especially apply to suicide death, uh, but not to most other sudden deaths. Um, drug overdoses can also get the same kind of negative judging dynamics, but I just want to, um, you know, highlight that um, it's important for us as a larger society to treat suicide as a public health issue, just like we do with cancer and diabetes, because that way it takes all of these negative uh, connotations, stigma, and shame out of the equation. So postvention is a planned response, and it's a it's a proactive approach, um, developing agency protocols before there's been a sudden death to include suicide. And the bottom line is we're trying to promote healing and reduce risk for all. Um, knowing someone who has died by suicide increases our own risk for suicide, and that's for young and for older as well. And that's very well established in the uh, research literature. And of course, with our youth and young adults, their risk, uh, their vulnerability is far greater uh, than others. There's bra their brains are not fully developed until the mid twenties. Uh, they have less life experience. They have limited coping skills. So one of the things I will say for all of us as youth serving agencies and organizations is uh, contagion when there's been a suicide death, uh, that risk uh, is really important to offset with other kinds of uh, practices. So this postvention response, I realized when Jen was presenting is actually the opposite of the tier one, two, three model um, because in all three of these, um, I'm talking about an indicated, a selective, and a universal layer. Uh, but first, when there's been a suicide death, whether in person or in this virtual world, we really are looking at what that inner circle of friends and family um, is all about, how they're doing, what kinds of supports and needs um, we need to uh, respond to. But then you have the larger selective layer, and that's directed to that surrounding community or that surrounding school. And this is where trauma-informed care really comes to play. Um, because this, in a COVID-19 world, this might be where we identify other key stakeholders, um, like that leverage of, of um, school supports that Jen had talked about, um, other key stakeholders that might not be working from home. So school resource officers, community police officers, mobile health response, any kind of community-based entity that might be better positioned to convey local and national resources to lost survivors, anyone in the community who's been affected by this suicide death. And then finally, the universal approach for the media coverage. And of course, this is where we're going to be responding to uh, social networking um, that is done by young and older. One of the things I wanna say about the indicated layer is that in today's current climate, 
um, many school crisis response team members across the United States, they are communicating and collaborating behind the scenes um, with one another to reach out to those higher risk staff and students after a, a death by suicide. So it's really important that what used to get done in the counseling offices or in the administrative offices at school, that it still happens behind the scenes so that we can promote healing and reduce risk moving forward. So in my PowerPoint, all of these blue slides really, uh, they, they apply to both uh, in-person postvention and um, in COVID-19 um, uh, postvention. And so as schools and as communities, we always feel that um, that tricky balance, uh, respecting a family's right to privacy, and yet responding to suicide as a public health issue. Um, suffice it to say, all of the negative connotations that I covered earlier that, by the way, do not apply to other public health issues like diabetes or heart disease, um, sometimes families in their grief and loss just can't go there. Um, so then we could just refer to it as a sudden death. But the bottom line is, we always want to make those local and national resources available. We also always want to normalize and validate the process of grief and loss. That's and the reactions that go along with that. That's really critical in reducing the risk for complicated bereavement and certainly the risk for um, increased suicidality moving forward. So this contagion risk is what I had referred to earlier. And anytime there's been a suicide death, particularly of a young person, but it could be an older, more, um, more engaged, more involved um, adult or older adult in the community, uh, that exposure to that person's suicide death may influence others who already might be at risk um, to then uh, take their life or act on uh, their suicidal feelings as we've talked about earlier. Um, so all of us as youth service serving agencies must know that this applies very much to our youth and young adults. This is a quote from uh, Kay Redfield Jameson. I highly recommend her as an author uh, that suicide is a death like no other and lost survivors end up um, struggling with the aftermath um, in many shapes and forms after the, the death. And so for lost survivors, grief and loss is often pretty complicated, um, pretty painful, both physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, any way you look at it. And it may involve all of these different kinds of feelings that you see on the slide here. Uh, but often what we see is that universal question of why. Um, and this really can pervade a person's uh, healing journey uh, for many, many years. And unfortunately, oftentimes the answer uh, did die with that person. So the complexity of grief and loss, it is incredibly compounded, as we've heard earlier, uh, by COVID-19 restrictions and isolation. Yet these emotional reactions to the loss are still being experienced. So especially for our youth and young adults, they need healthy channeling and expression of those feelings. Um, I have attached four different postvention in this COVID-19 climate uh, resources um, as, as handouts for this. So please seek those out. But really we're talking about regular reaching out to family and peers by phone or through presence alone. Um, if I had somebody close to me uh, die by suicide, and they were local enough, I'd be driving my car and just sitting out in the driveway so that they would know I was there, that I had presence. The same thing can happen by dropping off gifts of comfort or food um, on their doorstep. Um, and so it's really important to brainstorm um, with community members, with our families from schools about how they can support 
the, that inner circle of family or friends who has lost somebody to suicide. And certainly uh, trauma-informed care comes into play with regard to what is already being experienced prior to the suicide death uh, moving forward. And so when we talk to loss survivors, and that would be any of us, young or older, in the aftermath of a suicide death in our community, um, it's so important to bring our A game in terms of being gentle, non-judgmental, and just being, being the gift, uh, bringing the gift of being there. Um, and again, this is where we can bring uh, to the table, local and national resources. And as you can see on your slide, um, if suicide survivor support groups, or bereavement groups can be helpful. Uh, many virtual support groups for loss survivors are now being facilitated across the country. Um, so there are some options out there um, to provide people with those kinds of virtual connections for their grief and loss. And language is key. Uh, sensitive language without the judgment, without the labeling would mean died by suicide or lost to suicide. Um, I would not want to use the term successful suicide or completed suicide because that conveys accomplishment, that conveys a, a job well done. That's just not appropriate for this public health issue of suicide death. Likewise, People uh, may commit sins, they may commit crimes. And loss survivors, family members who've lost somebody close to suicide, uh, their loved one was not a criminal or a sinner. So if we really wanna continue uh, with sensitivity and compassion, died by suicide, lost to suicide. In terms of promoting healing, um, this is really key because we really need to ensure those mental health and physical health supports are there um, for the first six months. We do want to validate and normalize those grief and loss reactions, and we want to look out for folks who are uh, demonstrating uh, warning signs, talking about, uh, talking about or uh, expressing those warning signs that Jen had covered. Bottom line is we're trying to restore community spirit, um, strengths, and sensitivity. And it's a new normal. It's a healing journey that we're going to go for uh, through. In terms of our community response, we want to offset that risk for contagion, as I mentioned. And this is where that safety net that Jen mentioned comes into big play. That good networking and interface among all community agencies, especially during this COVID-19 time. So the local schools getting along with the local police and the local police getting along with the local mental health center, et cetera. And certainly we want to promote safe messaging in all of our discussions, whether online or offline, about this death. We do not want to focus on any graphic details of the death, and we do not want to focus on what the person used to die. They, lost, they were lost to suicide. They died by suicide. That's it. That treats it as a public health issue. And of course, we are always monitoring, um, hopefully um, well-intended or well-informed uh, adults and youth leaders, um, because this might not be just about Facebook. It might be Twitter. It might be Snapchat, Instagram. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to make available those local and national resources. We're trying to offer our condolences in a virtual world. Um, and then we're trying to monitor the electronic technology communications so that we can identify any other kind of risk from other individuals. We definitely want to explore those virtual options uh, for connecting with youth and young adults. But we wanna treat all suicide, all sudden deaths the same in light of the stigma and risk for contagion. COVID-19 has clearly leveled the field for funeral services for all deaths. Um, and therefore it calls for innovative heart-centered ways to reach out and in to those groups and individuals bereaved by loss. 
Um, so recommended memorial activities for the school in person, that channeling of grief, that expression of grief and loss, that's where we would offer the nurse's office or the uh, school counselor's office where teddy bears and poems and notes could be left behind. Um, and certainly best practices nationally would say, uh, please in, in locations all across the country, let's consider other locations for other than the school um, where the individual attended for funeral services. How this applies to COVID-19 um, is still the channeling of that expression of grief and loss. So gifting the family with memories, what you'll miss most about this person in a heartfelt manner. Um, and sending along poems, songs, video collages, whatever works for the person, the young person or older person who is grieving that this person is no longer here. I love that gifting the family with memories and it is actually in uh, one of the documents, the loss in isolation uh, that I've provided you with. General postvention guidelines would definitely mean confirming the facts which often is with the local law enforcement who are investigating these types of deaths. It might be with the family, although keep in mind that the family is in a very, very vulnerable um, uh, trauma, uh, tra traumatic place right now. Um, and we do not wanna focus on those specific details. And this is gonna be a long impact type of death. Contact with family. Uh, this is really important that even in COVID-19, that any kind of school uh, administration or school crisis response temp team members have kind of uh, um, arranged who is going to be the liaison with the family to express those condolences. And then contact with the staff. That's very key, even in these times, because Again, staff need the, uh, the opportunity to uh, express their grief and loss as well. We don't know what um, kinds of trauma uh, staff have, have, have had with, re with regards to suicide loss. So it's a very good thing for administrators or school crisis response team members to have um, those connections with staff as well. And then how the school handles uh, the initial announcement, even during COVID-19, is pretty critical in terms of showing accountability, response, and sensitivity to this type of loss. Um, these three talking points in the middle of your slide really talk about an emotional triage so that in person we can keep an eye on who's not doing well because we're not doing a large assembly and we're not doing any kind of messaging over the public announcement system. The idea is those, uh, those keeping in touch virtually the way uh, many school crisis response team members do with high risk students um, around the country in the wake of a suicide death. And then for youth of all ages, it's so critical and imperative that we let them know there are places and people they can access for help. They need to be gentle with themselves and no matter what, this person's death is not their fault. The research shows that a multiplicity of factors uh, leads to the tragic outcome of a suicide. So bullying doesn't cause suicide. The breakup of a relationship doesn't cause suicide. Major depression doesn't cause suicide, but rather it's a whole combination of factors. So we need to reiterate that to our youth and young adults that it is not their fault. And then, of course, this is where we bring in the larger safety net. Um, we may need crisis and counseling assistance um, and help in these virtual times from neighboring schools and agencies. Um, this safety net is one of communication and collaboration, and it will determine how well the mental health is going to go for our students, our staff, and others in our communities. Self-care, self-care, self-care. I can't say enough about this. We're coming full circle for ensuring the role modeling and ongoing practices 
of self-care for an effective postvention response. And by the way, yes, that applies to all of us out here who are school administrators, school crisis response team members, any of us who are care providers uh, caring for others. And when we do work with individuals, families, and communities, reduce risk and promote healing, postvention then turns into prevention. And the suicide warning signs that Jen talked about, this is them. This is what we're looking for, looking to hear so we can get help before another suicide incident happens. And finally, hope for these times. In this world of postvention and in this current world of COVID-19, we can heal through these losses. In choosing hope, it might not be a perfect postvention response, but it does make it a human response. Thank you. And thank you so much for all of that important information. I am going to uh, get the screen back. If you can stop sharing your screen. Thank you. Okay. Okay, couple last things. You'll have this in the handouts. I know that you are uh, able to see these uh, once we distribute the slides. A couple of really important crisis hotlines that have already been mentioned by speakers, but wanted to make sure additional hotlines were all available to you in one place. Um, and there's been so many wonderful questions that I've seen pop up. We'll have time to get to a couple of right now. Um, we're gonna launch a poll. Um, and some evaluation uh, while you're typing into the chat some of your questions. One of the things that I saw, I'm going to start us off with you, Anne. A couple of people were asking, uh, you mentioned something about uh, inappropriate funeral events. Could you say what you meant by that? Uh, okay, that's a trickier, that's a trickier thing, but the bottom line is, um, we want we do not want to increase the risk of people that are already at risk or thinking of suicide so we would not want to say this person went to a better place or they are now out of pain and oftentimes faith leaders and community providers and members might say something like that to offer comfort but we we have to really watch how we uh talk about um, the person's death uh, because if I'm feeling suicidal and my, my classmate who died by suicide is now in a better place, I may want to go there as well. So it's a longer answer, uh, but it really means mindful, deliberate work with other school crisis response team members and others in our organizations. And one more question for you, Anne. What do you do? And I, I worked in schools for a long time, and this came up uh, frequently. What do you do when the family doesn't want to uh, say that it was a suicide? So if you're doing both kind of the broad crisis intervention and uh, postvention that we need to do to keep other people safe, what do you do? I would say that we use the term terminology of sudden death or untimely death. Sometimes um, family members in that inner circle, uh, they just need a little more time. Faith leaders might be working with them or other individuals who are public health advocates might be working with them that eventually they can openly talk about suicide death as a public health issue. Uh, but in the meantime, we need to really show great sensitivity and compassion to that inner circle of family members and friends a, because they're already at greater risk for suicide themselves, but B, also because it's the sensitive, human, compassionate thing to do. Yeah, thank you. A um, couple of just websites here, and I'm going to turn it to Katie for a moment as well. I want people to know how they can find out more information. Our email information for all of the presenters is in the slides as well. Um, I know that I want to make sure people have a chance to... Uh, see where they can contact us for more information, but also please feel free to have uh, questions come in. Uh, Katie, did you want to just say something about the School-Based Health Alliance before we take a last couple questions? Yes, thanks, Julie. 
I just wanted to say uh, thank you on behalf of the Alliance and the National Center for School Mental Health and our partners uh, at SPRC and EDC. Uh, thank you to all the presenters for being here today and addressing this important topic. And, and also I wanna thank everyone in attendance for everything you do to support the health and safety of young people every day, especially during these challenging times. You can see our uh, COVID-19 resources on the screen as well as uh, our, our general website link. Uh, and then the next slide, Julie has information from the Center for School Mental Health on their website. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna take a couple of questions uh, from our presenter, to our presenters if people you know, wanna stay on for a few more minutes. I also know we're gonna try to get to some of these questions uh, in a, an additional resource. We're not gonna be able to get to everything. I really encourage people to take a look at the SPRC website or the Zero Suicide website, the NAMI uh, Connect website. There's a lot of information there about many, some of the things that I'm seeing. Um, I see something about suggestions about how we can remind state boards of education and legislators um, uh, that how do we kind of help these decision makers and advocates focus on social, emotional wellness and mental health? Um, you know, is there anything that people in schools can do, teachers can do? We know that uh, it's gonna be a long year in front of us. Right now we're not really seeing, I saw a couple of questions about is suicide increasing? The answer is uh, A, we don't know because the data takes a long time to come out and really be assessed, but B, we don't think at this point suicide rates are going up and that's because it's often during a crisis uh, in the midst of the crisis, uh, people kind of hunker down and mm -hmm. kind of operationalize and you know, kind of functionally get through the things they need to get through, but it's shortly when the crisis begins to uh, decrease a little bit and people are left with the uh, challenges they faced before, new challenges that sometimes these suicide events, that's when they go up. We saw this with events like 9-11 and kind of other really significant global events. So what I'm seeing is people ask, so how do we prepare for that now uh, at all different levels? And do you have anything you want to Oh, Add. I certainly do. Thank you, Julie. Um, how, how schools and crisis response team members prepare is uh, have those Zoom meetings or whatever virtual meetings uh, need to be convened in order to have some postvention protocols in place prior to suicide deaths from happening. And those suicide deaths, they're, they're not just about our students. It could be our families. It could be the parents or guardians in the family. Uh, it could also be, um, it could be our school staff themselves. It could be our mental health providers. Um, the bottom line is you really, just like schools prepare for disasters, bomb threats, things like that, there need to be proactive protocols in place for how to respond to these types of deaths. Right, I mean, I think preparation is key. I mean, both mm -hmm. at postvention levels, think now. Who can you collaborate with around? What do you want from your state boards of education? Start thinking now about how to put that in place. Uh, how can you, I think, I, I know this, I'm hoping that this webinar will build on some of these conversations. I know that uh, the School-Based Health Alliance and the Center for School Mental Health are hoping to do additional webinars. I think one of the future ones uh, that we all need to think about is what happens when we go back to school and supporting mm -hmm. kids' social and emo uh, emotional needs. I do see, um, a couple of questions, and I think this will be the last question I take perhaps because of time, and sorry about the call in the background. Um, Postvention, what about the, you know, I, I've seen these questions a lot, memorials. Mm -hmm. What can we, what do we do for memorials? What do we do on the one year anniversary? Okay, so first I get to put a plug for the Suicide Prevention Resource Center here. Um, the sprc.org website is a it's, it's an archive and a treasure for all things related to suicide um, prevention and postvention. So that after a suicide toolkit um, is, a, is an excellent resource for school-based um, um, folks to uh, address that. When it comes to memorials, what I would say is what we want to do is we, we as schools do not want to own the memorial because that's about death and dying. We want to focus on hope. 
we want to focus on recovery and the fact that people can get treatment. And so that's why we wouldn't want to do a yearbook dedication to any young or older individual who has died by suicide because it's about death. And now if I'm at risk for suicide, I might look at that and say, that could be me on that yearbook cover. So again, all I can say about in a short amount of time with the, mo with the memorials, convene people who are like-minded, your school crisis response team members, your school administration, get those resources from sprc.org, as well as the other collaborative entities that are sponsoring this panel, and then go to work in a proactive manner to keep people safe moving forward. I think on those words of wisdom, that is the best place to stop and the best advice. Uh, I hope this stimulates conversation in your school districts. I think you need to, I think one of the most important things is if you uh, have questions after today or this prompted, I wonder what my school does, what are we allowed to do, what are the rules, what are the expectations? Uh, this is the time to ask. You, we would, you know, this should be an open dialogue in your school. It shouldn't be something that everybody tries to solve in the moment of a crisis. They should have plans in place, just like they would have plans uh, for other events. My, my kids do lockdown drills in their schools and things like that. We have to have drills in place to know what we're going to do when somebody is at risk for suicide so with, we can keep people safe and calm and, and get their needs met. I really want to thank all of our presenters and collaborators uh, for today's webinar. The topic is so important and it's really a pleasure to have been invited to, to be able to share this time with you. Good luck to everybody. Uh, it's hard thank times. You. You're all doing great work. Uh, keep it up and, and stay well. Have a Bye. great day. Bye. Thank you.